So please tell us a bit about yourself. I'm Catherine Dalton and I am a translator and also a PhD student at the University of California at Berkeley. And um, prior to coming to Berkeley about two years ago, I was living for 10 years in Kathmandu, Nepal, where I worked um, as a teacher and a translator and also I was a student um, at the Rangjun Yeshe Institute, which is part of, or which is actually, the Center for Buddhist Studies at Kathmandu University. Um, I work as a translator for the Dharma Chakra Translation Committee, which is a translation committee um, directed by Chukini Rinpoche. And um, as part of that uh, committee, I have been involved in a number of different translation projects over the years. Together with another member of the Dharma Chakra Translation Committee, a friend of mine, Ryan Damron, I have been involved in um, developing and um, implementing, I guess, a translator training program that uh, this has been going on the past two summers that's located in Northern California at Chukini uh center, Rangjun Yeshe Gomde. And the idea for that project and why I feel it's related to the 84,000 project is that um, we are trying to help train young uh, translators who are particularly interested specifically in working on 84,000 projects. And so when we, uh, in the classroom setting, we actually um, work with them on some active projects that we're, we're translating for 84,000 with the hopes that they could gain the specific types of skills that are necessary for working on these particular texts, um, the Kongyur texts. Um, that would be helpful in the future for 84,000. So um, my involvement has been yeah, in those capacities, really. Can you explain what the title of the play in full means? The uh, play in full, or in Sanskrit it's called the Lalita Vistara, um, the Gyacha Rope Do in Tibetan. Um, and in this, uh, this sutra basically is the story of the Buddha's life. And so the title the play in full, um, well basically we can break it down into two parts, the play in full. The play refers to the uh, aspect of the Buddha's life as it is portrayed in a Mahayana Sutra context. And in the Mahayana, um, the understanding of the Buddha's life is um, it is such that it is, it's a type of play or display of his activity. Um, the sutra recounts the time of the Buddha's uh, awakening, the initial parts of his life up until his awakening as Shakyamuni Buddha. And those events, those acts are seen in the Mahayana context, not as being um, just ordinary uh, karmic activities as such, but more as being kind of the play or the display of the wisdom of this bodhisattva who is about to awaken to perfect Buddhahood. And in full, the aspect, um, that aspect of the title, Vistara or uh, Gyachewa, this vast aspect, basically we can understand it in two ways. Um, on one hand, it is the full account in the sense that it's quite extensive, it's quite detailed, it tells a lot about, um, a lot of detail about what, what Shakyamuni uh, or the, what Shakyamuni Buddha did as a bodhisattva before the moments in, in which he awakened to perfect Buddhahood. But uh, we can also understand this aspect of vastness or this fullness, the play in full, in the context of the Mahayana perspective on awakening. And so from that perspective, the play, the display of the Buddha's life in full is a more, uh, a more full account, a more complete account of actually what awakening is from a Mahayana perspective. This text is 432 pages long in Tibetan. <laughs> Can you give us a summary of the text? The shortest summary of the text is just to tell you that it's, it's about the life of the Buddha, in particular his awakening. Um, but to expand on that a little bit more, the sutra, the framework for the sutra is the Buddha is actually giving a discourse to a group of gods and bodhisattvas. And they ask him, can you please tell 
this, um, can you please teach us this, these discourses, these sort of vast discourses called the Lalita Vistara, which recount the story of the Bodhisattva uh, on his journey to awakening, the last bits of his journey to awakening. And the Buddha um, is silent, and by his silence he agrees to, he indicates that he agrees to tell this account. And so the most of the sutra is actually the Buddha recounting his own life story as uh, the Bodhisattva and then his awakening. So that story begins in the last um, bit of his previous life, actually, as a Bodhisattva where he was born in the heavenly realms and he's living in the heavenly realms. And um, he is reminded of the commitment that he has made towards perfect awakening. And so he chooses to depart from the heavenly realms and to take birth in the world. And the story recounts his descent into the womb of his mother, Queen Maya Devi. And he resides in her womb in uh, a, a beautiful palace, like a temple. Um, and he remains in samadhi in her womb. And then the text describes his birth. Immediately upon his birth, he announces that this will be his last life and that he's as a, um, a non, not a perfectly awakened being and that he's going to awaken. The story continues um, discussing his infancy um, in which he uh, is taken to a temple and the gods of the temple actually, the stone images greet him, stand up to greet him. And um, he, he, it talks about his youth, you know, he goes to school and he is, um, already knows more than the smartest of his teachers and his tutors. He's, uh, the text speaks about his great capacity in the arts, basically, of the day, in sport, archery, and so on. He marries. Um, he lives in great luxury uh, in his father's palace. Um, he then, as you know, the, I'm sure many of us have heard this, this story, the Buddha, uh, or the Bodhisattva at that time, um, actually while he's living in luxury, he sees a sick person, he sees an old person, he sees a corpse, and he sees a religious mendicant. And these sights inspire him to renounce his life, his worldly life. And so he actually leaves the palace and goes out um, to practice and to with the intent of, of awakening. And he studies with some teachers. Um, he's not satisfied with what they teach him. He um, practices extreme austerities, actually, um, and finally realizes at a certain point that these austerities are really not going to get him there. And so he finally takes uh, a meal and goes to the seat of awakening. Um, the sutra is quite interesting, quite lovely, in that it, all of these activities of the bodhisattva's life are framed within the context of this is what bodhisattvas do when they're about to awaken to Buddhahood. And so he goes to the, the seat of awakening because that's where all the Buddhas have awakened in the past. So very much the whole story is perfumed with this Mahayana um, perspective on the world. It's a Mahayana worldview. And so the Bodhisattva goes finally to the, the seat of awakening. He sits to practice. Um, Mara, the demon, comes and does his best to distract the Bodhisattva and to prevent him from awakening. Um, he fails um, and the Bodhisattva awakens to perfect Buddhahood. Um, he awakens and then all of the gods come to praise him. He spends seven weeks without teaching, wandering in the forest. Eventually, the gods Brahma and Indra come to him and ask him to teach. Um, and he responds to this request knowing that it would be best to teach to his... Uh, he had some companions, five companions previously when he was practicing um, austerities. And he goes and finds those companions um, in the Deer Park at Sarnath and near Benares. And then he teaches, he preaches to them the first, the first sermon, the, his first teachings on the Four Truths of the Noble Ones. And that actually is the conclusion of this story. Um, interestingly, the story does not 
uh, encompass the entirety of his life in the way that we might think of a, a, an account of someone's life would go all the way, of course, until their death. Um, this account begins in the previous life of the Bodhisattva, his descent into the womb, and it, it continues only until his first teaching. Um, and then it breaks off and the, the narrative concludes with, you know, the, the Buddha having told this story himself um, to his disciples, the gods and, and his human disciples. And then he t tells them, um, you know, that they should practice basically uh, in this way. What role did you play in the translation of this text? My role in this translation um, was as part of a team of translators, all part of the Dharma Chakra translation group. There were actually six of us who were working on the actual translation of the text from Tibetan to English. Uh, others, we also had a, a Sanskrit um, consultant <laughs> work on the text with us as well. So my role was to translate a segment of the text into English, um, a few chapters. And uh, which included, in my case, the chapter describing the birth of the Buddha, which um, was especially lovely. And why did you need such a big team and how did you all coordinate? We needed such a big team um, because otherwise it would have taken a lot longer to complete this translation. So in order to actually make it available in a reasonable amount of time, um, the text, as we have discussed already, is very long. And so um, working in a team, we were able to split up the text and to each translate a segment of the text. And then all of those segments um, were passed on to the main translator who was kind of coordinating the whole project and who was um, then put all of those individual segments together and check them against the Tibetan um, and did some editing as well. We communicated primarily by email because um, we are all over the globe. Um, you know, I started this project uh, when I was living in Kathmandu and then I moved to California and the main translator who was coordinating the text lives in Denmark and uh, others of us live various places in the U.S. Someone else spent some time in Austria. Another translator was in Brazil part of the time. So really, we were all over the globe. And um, part of the coordinating um, that took place was just coordinating our vocabulary for the text. Part of the requirement for working on translations for 84,000 is to compile a glossary. And the way that we did that actually was just using a Google Doc um, so that we could all work together and we could all add whenever we came across a word that needed to enter the glossary, we would put it up and then we would be checking always um, to see if someone else had encountered that word before and so on. And that way we were able to be consistent with our vocabulary. And when it happened, which it did happen, of course, um, that one person had translated a word one way and somebody else wanted to translate it a different way, then we would in initiate an email conversation. And we actually had a lot of discussion over email about the terminology um, of the text that we were, you know, that we were working on. And for me, that's actually, um, that's actually an important part of, of the process. That's why I like working as part of a group. Um, it just so happens that I like the other members of the team that I worked with very much and their friends um, and uh, fellow practitioners. And so that is, uh, you know, of course, a, a pleasant part of working together. But I just I learned so much actually um, working with other translators. And um, in terms of ways of translating words, in terms of um, the way of understanding a particular text, um, it's, it's really, I think, a great benefit to be able to work with a group of translators. What are some of the joys and challenges you faced while translating the text? Well, my training um, in Tibetan Buddhist uh, study, the study of Tibetan Buddhism, was done in a pretty traditional context in a monastery in Nepal, um, according to the traditional style of study. And the traditional style of studying um, Tibetan in a Shedra style context, right? A monastic college style context that was uh, sort of reformulated to fit a non-monastic group of students. But um, the traditional course of study primarily is the 
commentarial tradition. We study commentaries on the Buddha's teachings. Um, and so I actually hadn't spent a lot of time reading the words of the Buddha. I had read uh, in the academic context a number of sutras in translation, but I would say the majority of my um, studies of, of Tibetan Buddhist texts um, had been Shastric texts, commentarial texts. And so for me to have the opportunity and, you know, not just this project, of course, but other, you know, translation projects I've worked on for 84,000, to just really spend the time reading sutra. It's, they're beautiful. I love, it turns out that I love to read sutras. I didn't know that. I love it. I'm incredibly grateful to have the opportunity to work with the Dharma Chakra translation group and I get so much out of it personally and I feel like I feel like as a group of translators we actually support each other in ways that are very helpful. I um it I feel more confident about putting my own translations out there when I know that they've been reviewed by my peers who are quite skilled translators and I love having the opportunity to review the work, the translation work that um, other translators in the group have done. I get a lot out of reading their translations. I hope that they get some benefit out of reading mine and um, just being able to discuss, to learn from one another. One thing about this translation, this particular text, is that we have a Sanskrit uh, edition that was made based on Sanskrit manuscripts. So having access to the Sanskrit is, I would say, both a joy and a difficulty. Um, there were, when I came across difficult passages in the text, I was able to look at the Sanskrit, um, which it does add difficulty because when you're working with two different languages, um, that just adds another layer of complication. But it also, in a lot of instances, adds clarity. So that was, it's wonderful. I mean, it's great to have the Sanskrit. Um, but also one thing that was kind of interesting to me actually is that um, <laughs> sometimes when a passage was difficult in Tibetan, then I would think, oh great, I can look at the, Tibet the Sanskrit and that will clarify the passage. But often what happens is the reason it's difficult in Tibetan <laughs> is because it was difficult in Sanskrit and that difficulty was rendered by the translators uh, who translate the text into Tibetan. So it doesn't always pan out um, so that it really sort of clarifies things, but um, it was uh, pleasant, but also challenging to have the opportunity to work with the Sanskrit. Um, I looked at some passages myself, and then we also had a, a member of our team who looked at the entire translation, compared it against uh, against the Sanskrit, and his comments also were very helpful. And how long have you been a translator, and what inspires you to keep going? I have been I've been an oral interpreter um, of Tibetan for ten years. Wow, uh, and. I've been working on written translations for, I guess, maybe eight of those years. I think, to be honest, what I find most inspiring are my teachers, actually. Um, I guess I see translation as a part of practice. As a Buddhist practitioner, I, I think translation is a part of my practice. And so, um, and so in my practice, I look to the example of my teachers and they are able to give a tremendous amount, a tremendous amount to their students and to the wider communities in which you know, they participate. And I feel that having the opportunity to work as a translator allows me to make a small contribution, a small offering to the community of Buddhist practitioners, um, and and what what I find inspiring, I guess, is seeing my teachers um, just give with so much energy and vigor and love and compassion, and that inspires me to try and give as much as I can. Of course, I can't give in the way that they can, but. Um, I, I do find real inspiration in, in 
in their 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 being, their person, who they are, what they do, how they live in the world. Because I work as part of the Dharma Chakra Translation Group, which is um, headed by my teacher, I feel that I'm so incredibly lucky that in some sense I feel like my work is also an offering to my teacher. Every time I, I work on a translation, I think about that, actually, and how precious how incredibly, pre how incredibly precious it is to, to be able to do that. Yeah, and my parents are both social workers. And so they, I feel like their jobs uh, were always also part of a contribution that they were making to a larger community. And in some sense, I think that working um, in you know, education, and, and I think as a translator, it, it is like that in some sense. that that I have the opportunity to do something that I love to do. I guess it's just my own curiosity about this te these texts. I love studying about the Buddhist tradition. I think it's, I just think it's really fun. And I'm, I'm curious, I'm always curious about how different Buddhists um, over time in history in different places and in different times have formulated the teachings in different ways that are able to inspire and to benefit different people, that are able to, um, to um, help more beings awaken. And so I just, I enjoy reading Buddhist texts and I enjoy translating them because it makes me read them more carefully because it makes me read them more attentively, because my, I personally get so much out of working on these type of translations. But primarily, I think the motivation really is, um, is, is, is my teachers, the model of, of my teachers and having um, the opportunity to do something that they have told me is valuable and that I personally feel is valuable. Um, that that's what keeps me going when it's difficult when there's a passage that I just can't figure out what it's saying and that's what really um, in the end inspires me. <laughs>